One muggy November afternoon, I was looking through music in Star Records in the arcade when I came across a poster which read, The Prodigy, Sligo Sports Centre, December 29th. Lame and the boys were coming to town and shit was about to go down. Christmas felt long in my dull, drab, grey house. So when the 29th of December came along, I was dying to get out. When I arrived at Bonds in Castle Street, it was agreed we spend as little time as we could in the flat so we can get out to the sports centre and sell as much as we could before the prodigy took to the stage. Now recently, I'd begun to notice how this year began to act ever slightly more cuntish towards me. Whenever I'd arrive at the flat and he'd open the door, he'd just leave it open and walk straight back in without saying hello. I suppose he'd become jealous because I'd been promoted to the role of dealer and he'd been demoted to the role of lookout. In hindsight, I should have seen the darkness building inside him, but I respected him so little I didn't see the danger. Sligo Sports Centre was a great spot for selling drugs. Set in the edge of town, it was, and still is, surrounded by small woods and fields. Great for staying out of the spotlight and under the radar. Far better than the relative openness of Wine Street. I was stood behind a 50-seater coach that had O'Gorman's Balahadrine written on the side. And from there I had a great view of proceedings. In between sales, I'd peruse all the characters that were lined up in the queue. Most of the people that we expected to be there were there. But a few of the punters were under college age. You know, kids who were been dropped off by their mams and dads in 94 SO reg cars. Rich kids from country fucking family bungalows. You know, with manicured gardens and happy fucking Christmases. I noticed one fella as he got out of a brand new Toyota Corolla. He was dressed pretty much like me. Black X-Works, Nike Air Max, a baseball cap pulled low over an acne infested visage. He was about 17 and his social awkwardness stood out like an acne infested visage. I didn't know who he was as I'd never seen him in Sligo before but he made his way over to a group that included Johnny Costello, another well-known slag with athletics personalities. They saluted him, so they must have known who he was, but still, he stood at the edge of the group, speaking to no one. As soon as somebody handed him a can of beer, somebody shouted in the ear, can I have a 10 spot please? And the attention turned to the job at hand. After about an hour and a half of pretty brisk business, Bond came over to me and told me to give him me stash, that he was going to hide it outside and we could all go in and enjoy the concert. I was buzzing with excitement. By the time we got inside, the fourth dimension were just finishing up and the place was banging. After about 10 minutes of roadies running about the stage and moving things around, the whole place went dark and silent. One or two people whistled loudly, a few called out Keith's name, but after about three minutes of silence and darkness, a low guttural cockney voice calls out, All right, you Sligo people, let's give it to the fuckers. And just then, a nasally American voice calls out, What we're dealing with here is a total lack of respect for the law. And then a dirty, scratchy guitar riffs rhythmically. A raucous breakbeat takes over the joint, 
and the lights flick on to show a topless Maxime holding a mic and raising his hand so as to raise our spirits. I'm surrounded by all sides and the crowd is jumping in unison. Liam is riffing away on the guitar creating loops, then jumping to a computer, then jumping back to a keyboard to do the same all over again. Liam and Keith are geeing us up with some fancy footwork and all the while Maxime is calling out Fuck em, yeah! Fuck em and their law! Fuck em, yeah! It ain't a fucking law! Now, if it was even possible, the whole place went even wilder with this. Now a core bunch of lads who were well known for being hard in Sligo were mashing the shade out of each other. Myself, Quiva, Bon, Fishy and Garage were just stood at the edge of the marsh pit. Now a marsh pit's a very unpredictable place and within a few minutes it was starting to encroach on our place. Now the fucker Fishy, just as I was jumping up and down, he gave me a big nudge in the shoulder and pushed me into the direction of the marsh pit. To catch my balance, I grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him in along with me. I learned from a very early age that the best thing to do when someone gets in your face is to just go for it. So instead of jumping about meekly like all the other numpties around me, gave it socks flailing my arms all over the place, jumping back to back with whoever was closest to me, pulling fishy by the jumper and flinging him around all over the place. He didn't like that one bit. So he actually jumped out with the ruck and stood to the side. A face of fear and fury glaring back at me. But I didn't give a flying fuck. I'd found my superpower. And just then, an electronic keyboard kicks off and a voice booms out over the speakers. Everybody it's in the place, let's go. Everybody it's in the place, let's go. And then Maxine jumps to the top of the stage. Mic in hand, shouts out. All right, Sligo, this show is banging. You guys are wicked. But I reckon we could take this show to the next level, yeah? And with that, he starts pointing at different individuals. I want you, 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 and you. That last you was aimed directly at me. And with that, 20 of us were invited up onto the stage. Before we knew it, we were dancing with the fucking prodigy. So here I was, dancing the fucking quick step with the prodigy in Sligo. It's like manna from fucking heaven. I mean, all the shit that had happened over the last three months just disappeared into the shadows. I was happy, free. There was my crew down below, garage and barn, fist pumping the air, staring back at me happily. Jesus, even the cunt fishy. I felt a twinge of affection for him. Until he caught my attention. And he pointed over a Quiva, who was dancing right beside the Spotty Culchi. Spotty was whipping up a prodigy step as good as Leroy. Quiva would look over at him intermittently and give him the thumbs up and get back to her dancing. I'd look over at Bon, but he couldn't see what was happening. Then all of a sudden, a rage took over me. A rage like I'd never experienced before. It was a cocktail of emotions. I was envious that he was dancing with Quiva. Jealous of the fact that he could dance as well as me, if not better. I was annoyed that a geek like him could suddenly become impressive. Angry at the fact that this fucker, who probably came from a happy family, who had never known hurt, who had never suffered, could all of a sudden become impressive. I mean, who the fuck did he think he was? You don't just come to Sligo and act like a legend for one fucking night 
and dance with the most amazing woman in town. That's not how it fucking works. Before I knew it, I was back on the dance floor. I grabbed Spotty by the shirt and gave him an almighty headbutt. Before he had a chance to react, I pushed him to the ground and gave him kick after kick after kick at the head. It all happened so fast I can barely remember it. But I do remember being dragged away by a number of people and suddenly seeing a static lump on the ground, unmoving and lifeless. People stopped dancing and started looking over towards us. Maxine told Liam to cut the music and call for security. I just stood there, transfixed, numb, unable to move. Just staring at this kid's bloodied head and face. Very soon after that, I left Lego. Never returned. 